Um, so so I'm, I'm, I have this, uh, our final panellist has, has appeared <laughs> as, as, as if by magic. Perfect, absolutely perfect timing. Just, just grab somewhere near the front for, for the time being. So um, I, I'm wearing this lapel mic, but the lapel mic is not, is not doing anything other than recording uh, for the purposes of uh, we're... So what we're going to do is we're recording my presentation, uh, which we're going to put on... Uh, on our YouTube site, which has got literally as many followers as, as Donald Trump has on Twitter, and is a, a real not to be missed um, experience. But we're, we're, we're recording my presentation, but what we're not going to do um, is, to, uh, is to record the Q&A, because we want that to be under, you know, kind of Chatham House rules. Uh, we have, uh, you know, one of our panelists is, 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 from, uh, is from Bayes. Bayes are, are working on a white paper that's related to this, and so uh, in, in kind of in, in deference to allowing him to say anything, if he can say anything anyway under the current yeah. environment, we should have to uh, wait and see on that one. We're not going uh, to record uh, that. So the, the the acoustics in here aren't bad. It's a we deliberately went for a relatively small uh, venue, and um, I, I am holding this microphone. I'm not actually sure whether it's doing anything. I think it, it may be slightly helping me to project. Um, but I'm going to be asking my panelists to speak largely. Uh, without uh, without uh, audio enhancement, and uh, the 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 upside of that is that it means that we don't have to have our debate conversation around the room impeded by people running around uh, handing microphones out to to everybody uh, in order to to, to capture uh, what you say. Now um, uh, Charlie will re reappear uh, in order to there he is uh, in order to chair uh, the panel. Obviously, we're about 15 minutes late starting. Uh, we've got some refreshments afterwards. We've got a slightly uh, loose finish time between 7 and... I was, I was aiming to kind of wrap up at about 7.15. And we'll still stick to that. I think we can run for an hour. I think that's enough. I think everyone will then be ready for uh, a glass of uh, Imperial College's excellent red wine. <laughs> their particularly high-quality Beck's beer. And their, their very, very famous uh, crisps olives and peanuts. Um, so, so let me get started. Okay, so, so we, we embarked upon this, uh, uh, this particular report uh, probably, uh, well, probably a year or so ago now. Uh, along the way, we produced a discussion paper uh, which was picked up and cited by the Committee on Climate Change, amongst others, in their, in their progress report to, to Parliament. Um, and we, we have run uh, a number of uh, uh, activities and events in this, um, in this broad, broad area. That's our advert slide. Sorry, I should have, should have remembered we had that up first. Energy Futures Lab is terrific. And the Centre for Climate Finance and Investment is, is, is no less. In fact, it's probably even more terrific. And <laughs> Imperial College is a, is a very uh, august place. Uh, so we've run a number of events and activities in this broad area. Uh, including some some interactions with with uh, with with, uh, with Jeremy Allen from Bayes and his colleagues, uh, trying to help them to think a bit about the uh, the white paper. Um, it's obviously uh, a very important topic in this country. Uh, it also has, I think, you know, really quite significant international uh, uh, resonance. This is a a, a kind of conversation uh, that we're having uh, globally, uh, which is, you know, what what is the future for renewables subsidy and support regimes? What does a what does a kind of a subsidy-free world look like? What does subsidy-free mean? Uh, and how how do we make wholesale market design fit for purpose when we're in a world with increasing shares of uh, zero marginal cost uh, renewable generation. So focusing you know, specifically on the, on, uh, on the UK, electricity market reform has been around since 2013. I'll come back to that as I go through. Uh, we've got a rising share of renewables up to around about the 20% mark now for variable renewables. And, uh, and more like 30% when you bring in uh, Drax and, uh, and uh, some of the hydro. 
In uh, 2017, Dieter Helm's review recommended, made some quite dramatic recommendations for change, which I'm, I'm going to come back to. Um, but he is far from being the only voice in this conversation, and there are a number of propositions around for what electricity markets might look like and how we might kind of like deal with the rising share of renewables. Uh, and we have the Bayes White Paper, which again I will come back to. And so we're, we're producing, we've produced, is yeah. now uh, available and was, please, please grab a coffee, a copy, uh, and a coffee. Uh, this, this um, exploring this space through the latest Energy Futures Lab uh, briefing paper. Um, I think looking at the attendance list, and also because I, we targeted who we invited to this, this workshop quite carefully, I won't be telling anybody in this room anything that they don't already know uh, through the next uh, few slides, but just to kind of, you know, give this very quick recap and also to plug Electric Insights, which is produced also by, 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 by Imperial College uh, colleagues, paid for by Drax, but don't allow that to put you off, um, which we, we kind of mine the data that's available from Alexon and so on. You know, we are seeing some very significant changes We've got the changes in terms of coal coming off the bars. We've got demand up largely flat, slightly falling. We've got very remarkable decarbonisation over the last uh, five, five, seven years or so, and this rising share um, from renewables. But obviously, what that brings in is a, a system. Okay, the, the, does the light work? Uh, some system balancing, system integration challenges, which are really quite. Uh, interesting and we need to talk, talk about and think about. Uh, I won't go back over EMR, but uh, we have you know, these, these, kind of, these, these, these four pillars. Particularly important in this context is the um, contracts for difference, a capacity mechanism to a certain extent, the carbon price floor, emissions performance standard really not particularly significant any, anymore. And to cut to, cut to the, the kind of cut to the chase in, in, in terms of at least part of this, uh, the purpose for our, for our paper. We don't have concerns about ad capacity adequacy, at least not in the short term. There have been many unintended consequences from both the capacity market and from the CFDs, and some unexpected things have been happening. Um, but judged on its own terms, EMR has given us an adequate level of capacity margin and brought through very remarkable reductions, it would appear, at least in the bid prices uh, for uh, contracts for difference. We can have a separate, and I'm sure perhaps we will, in, uh, in the discussion <coughs> conversation about whether EMR did what was anticipated of it in terms of new nuclear and indeed whether the capacity market will continue to be fit for purpose. So it's suspended at the moment, I'm sure we'll come back to that, but assuming that that minor difficulty uh, can be overcome, uh, whether it will be fit for purpose as, as coal closures proceed and so on. Uh, okay, at least for now, EMR seems to be doing more or less what we would, would have hoped that it might. Um, so what's the problem? Uh, so, you know, the first, the first problem if you like, um, is that uh, the Helm Review of uh, 2017 recommended that the contract for difference and the capacity market were effectively merged into a single equivalent firm uh, power auction, and that the spiky head chap, who may or may not continue to be a cabinet minister uh, as, as the exciting events unfold over the next uh, few weeks with the, uh, with the uh, leadership contests, said that, thank you, Dieter, extremely interesting. For the time being, we will not be uh, uh, we will we will not be moving immediately away from our CFDs, uh, but we will put in place a, a white paper process, and we will think uh, in a you know in, in, in over a, over an appropriate period of time about exactly how we will respond. Um, in fact, leading to what I call the Clark principles, the uh, market principle, using market mechanisms where we can. The insurance principle, 
uh, to try and bring forward particular technology options, uh, agility and no free riding. I'm sure we'll come back to, to all of those. For the most part, what we're going to be talking about uh, this evening is the market principle and its application to subsidy free re renewables. Uh, I think the second thing is this is the uh, this is uh, the the, the Bayes, most recent Bayes data projections data for capacity additions out to 2035, and you can see this isn't a this isn't um, a, perhaps a, a a view of what will happen. This is a view of what could happen, and what might be needed in order to be consistent with the carbon budgets. But the big blue chunk in the middle is the renewables additions. And so certainly if the sector deal for offshore wind is successful with 30 gigawatts of new uh, offshore wind, so we're looking at you know, approximately doubling the, the volume of renewables generation on the system. So that's a profound change. Um, so over the coming years, we will look to reforms of our CFD mechanism to make generators more responsive to market signals. <laughs> Well, what, how, much is, uh, how much reform are we going to need? What's, what, what kind of changes might we be looking at if we're going to bring this big slug of new variable renewables onto the system? And there's a balancing act. So the kind of thing that I will return to throughout my slides, and which we make a considerable amount of in the report, is that we are, on the one hand, looking to have a, an attractive investment env environment de-risked in the way that CFDs and feed-in tariffs in other countries currently are. And on the other hand, we would like to bring through more time of year and time of day price signals in order to help with the balance of system, system operation and so on. Sorry, this is kind of confusing me. I keep pressing it the wrong way. And there's a number of propositions in the conversation. <coughs> There are a number of variants on what I would call a split market approach to, to trying to tackle some of these problems. So effectively hiving off uh, variable generation from, from conventional firm power and finding a way to kind of think about how you pass that through <coughs> and how far it passes through and whether it actually ends up with the end consumer. So our end consumer is going to be asked to, if you like, kind of you know, choose between cheap but, but, uh, but, more, but less reliable and, and, uh, and more expensive but firm power. So there's a couple of propositions um, that, that we explore in the, in the report. I'm, I'm not going to try and read through Michael Liebrich's slightly cryptic uh, six principles, but it does end up with something that looks a little bit similar to effectively passing through more of the... Um, uh, more of the system variability through to end consumers and you know maybe we can have a discussion afterwards about how attractive that might be, how realistic it might be for that to happen, what the, what the regulator might have to say about that, how that might play into this ongoing conversation about trust uh, with uh, consumers being generally unhappy with their electricity providers uh, for reasons that we you know, might find quite difficult to fully understand. Now it wouldn't really be uh, complete if I didn't also mention the elephant in the room, which is whilst we're having a, a kind of technocratic conversation about exactly how we might reconfigure the uh, wholesale markets, uh, the, the, the main party of opposition has launched a, a, a manifesto, an expansion of their manifesto pledge for renationalisation re of... Uh, the distribution network operators and national grid. I can't really say anything other, other than just to kind of acknowledge that and then kind of go, oh, and then move on uh, and perhaps come back to it uh, in, uh, in discussion. There's also a number of, if you like, more gradualist approaches that are in the, uh, in the conversation. So the idea that we might stick with the CFD but make sure it's way below wholesale price that we might be able to expose, um, we might not expose, but encourage, allow, facilitate renewables generators in uh, participating in the balancing mechanism, 
contributing ancil to ancillary service provision, and essentially, you know, opening more of this time of day price responsiveness, providing, encouraging, facilitating more of that, whilst if, as you, if you like, kind of retaining some core revenue stability for, which has been so successful at attracting new classes of investor into, uh, into the renewables industry. And I'm not going to try and go through all of these in, in, in enormous detail um, this evening, but there are a number of different propositions from the likes of Aurora, Frontier Economics, some of the academics, to, to try and think about exactly what that might look like in practice and how you might be able to make that work. Um, there's also a, a conversation point around, well, couldn't you just get rid of the interventionism in the marketplace altogether? Does it really need to be that complicated? Uh, if this is a sector that no longer needs subsidy, then why does why do regulators, why does the government even need to be involved? Um, and that takes you into this, this kind of conversation about what, what you might describe as pure merchant investment in renewables plants. Um, so there is a small amount where compared to the when I say there's a small amount of that, usually a developer will stand up and put their hand up and say, I'm awfully cross with you because we're building a, you know, a gigawatt of this or something. A relatively small number of projects compared to the aspirations that we have for, for rollout of, ongoing rollout of, of zero carbon generation are going ahead on a pure merchant basis. So wholesale price only. Um, in some markets, we're seeing uh, a pure merchant corporate PPA uh, offer being attractively taken up by the Googles and the Amazons and the, you know, the, the big potential power purchasers striking a kind of deal, a bilateral deal to buy a green, green power. Um, but you know, with a focus on the UK, I don't see that as being a viable route to scaling the market uh, and, and kind of delivering against, you know, 80% or net zero or whatever is required. Not enough large customers, uh, not enough customers for long run contracts, you know, not enough kind of large industrial plants even, for example, that might be uh, uh, available for that. And for various reasons, anything, anything short of that doesn't really take away from the fundamental wholesale price risk exposure problem which CFDs were intended to solve. Um, there's also, I think, a very, very important to understand relationship between what kind of incentive stroke regulation stroke intervention environment might be appropriate and what the wider market context looks like. So who if we're going to be moving towards more purely private PPAs, who will the counterparts be? Is there a single buyer? How monopolized is this? Is this a kind of regulated utility, uh, large, you know, former US model that we're <coughs> playing into? Or is this a fully unbundled uh, system with you know, many market participants and a functional separation of transmission, distribution, generation, and supply? And so it's, it's, it's really not straightforward to be able to say, OK, well, you know, the government could be in, the government could be out, this could be pure merchant, renewables are cheap now. It's quite complex and it's very context specific. And the balance of plant and how large the system is also play into all of those conversations. OK, I'm going to move myself through a bit more quickly so that we can get on with the uh, discussion. Charlie and... Uh, uh, and uh, his colleague James, who's here uh, in the business school, uh, ran a ran a an investor survey, which we also report in the um, um, in the work in the briefing paper, and which which we will be writing up more more fully uh, in an academic context. And this very clearly, I mean, I guess you could say, well, you ask investors, they would say that, wouldn't they? But nevertheless, this very clearly shows 
this very, very strong, when asked, you know, what's the most important factors, uh, this, this, this kind of orangey-yellow bit here, is some form of pre-contracted revenue stability, uh, which overwhelms many of the other things that they were asked to kind of rate. This was a conjoint analysis where they were asked to kind of rank various different things and how, how important they are in, in framing and forming their investment decisions. And again, you can see in terms of positive or negative uh, uh, utility, the, the, sorry, trying to push the wrong button again, the most highly positively rated in terms of utility um, type of, uh, of um, payment structures are either you know, regulated returns or a single party PPA. So very, very important that we get this right because the UK or GB market is playing in a kind of, you know, an international field for project finance coming into our renewable sector at an acceptable cost. And I think it's really, really important to kind of bear this kind of investor perspective in mind because when we're thinking about how we might evolve and change the marketplace in the future, if we just assume that a much more risky, much more uh, un less interventionist uh, future might work in the UK, well, fine. If you're going to pay for it, if it's going to be, you know, if you're going to get higher rates of, uh, of, uh, of return here, or otherwise that financial community, those developers, and all of that uh, low carbon investment is just going to go somewhere else. Um, we've done a lot of work at Imperial College, both in terms of primary <laughs> engineering type studies, and also my colleagues uh, and I, in terms of secondary research, looking at the evidence base on this question of system costs. And there's a, a slide here from a paper which is forthcoming, uh, where we've been gathering together, building on the UKIRK uh, UK Energy Research Centre review of intermittency costs, which was published uh, a couple of years ago, looking at this question of system costs. So, you know, there's a fundamental sort of unargued assertion in the Helm review that says renewables impose high system costs, therefore they should be made to bear those costs, otherwise it's all going to get out of control and it's all. And actually what we see is that there's lots and lots of data and there's all sorts of kind of, you know, range and messiness, but up at this kind of 20% threshold, in many instances, you know, costs can sometimes even be negative, but costs are generally quite modest. This is five pounds per megawatt hour here. So we need to be careful before we jump to the conclusion that we have to make renewables bear all of their balancing costs because those balancing costs are inevitably huge. There's also a very good and important concern about who is best placed to, to manage those costs. And if your objective function is for costs to be minimized for consumers, then the most cost effective and most efficient thing to do is to ensure that the right people are managing those costs, which in some instances will be the system operator tendering for various kind of system services, rather than getting everybody to, to self-balance. I'm going to move on and come back to all of that. It's quite important stuff. Split markets seem to me to be very difficult. Right? Summary of what it says on that slide. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could do. So, and which of these various different options in various different contexts seems to make most sense is actually a very quite difficult to, to draw a firm conclusion about. And actually, I would say there isn't necessarily a best. There are a number of different fit-for-purpose options. And which of them is actually best is, in some respects, as much a question of implementation and institutional arrangements as what might be a kind of platonic ideal of what the absolutely perfect way of doing things might be. So I think we need to be, we're in a, we, well, it would be better to think about this as a kind of less of a, uh, an idealized new market creation exercise and more as a kind of pragmatic uh, management 
of multiple optimal, multiple suboptimal outcomes. Okay. At least one person is not nodding, which is very encouraging. Um, nearly, nearly got to the end. In fact, this is the, the, the last slide. So, to in in sum, you know, uh, EMR has had a number of unexpected consequences, but also judged on its most simple in its most simple terms has been has had considerable uh, success. Uh, the challenge that we face as we look uh, to the future is the, the balancing of minimizing individual levelized costs for the kind of power station or the wind farm gate against these wider system costs. And those two things may be in tension in terms of regulatory design. Okay, because you do one thing, it favors investors, they all give you they get a very nice low risk return. That messes things up for the balance of system. If you bring in more risk to try and sort things out for the balance of system, you take away the low risk rate of return. And so it's a bit like whack-a-mole, these two things kind of popping up next to one another. We know, because they tell us how much investors strongly value the kind of revenue stability which they've been previously provided through CFDs, which they might be able to get through a PPA but it's a more difficult and complex proposition. I don't think there's any, any proposition that's without drawbacks. And so therefore, I think, I think there's a lot to be said for these incremental approaches <coughs> that try to balance uh, <coughs> retaining the best of both worlds, really, introducing an increasing amount of price signal, removing the insulation, if you like, or the complete kind of uh, uh, cotton wool from renewables projects, but without removing that uh, revenue stability altogether and finding a kind of a gradualist approach. So the conclusion, which is that we always like to say that we need to do a load more work on this, uh, some of which is underway, but the case for radical reform is a long way from